Thanks everyone for joining today and welcome everyone to our webinar, Plastics from Source to Sea and Solutions Within. Today we are delighted to be joined by Max Kelly. Max is a marine scientist and a research fellow within the International Marine Litter Research Unit at the University of Plymouth, focusing on understanding the fate of plastic in the environment. Max is helping lead litter surveys across Indonesia to categorize and quantify litter from the point of release into the environment and at increasing distances from source to sea. Today's webinar will explore sources of plastic in the environment, where they go and their potential final fate. This webinar also focuses on the latest research in delivering a holistic approach to understanding and managing the risks posed by plastic pollution in Indonesia. As always, there'll be a chance for questions at the end of the presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation, and I'll then ask these on your behalf later on. This webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Thank you so much, Max, for joining us, and I'll hand over to you. Cheers. Thanks very much, Ethne, and the, and the wider IES team for inviting me onto this webinar series. Uh, hopefully over the next 40 minutes, I can give you a little bit of the, the, the tale of the, of the plastics problem from, from source to sea and touch on some of the research I've done during my PhD uh, and some of the work that we're, we're doing now uh, at the University of, of Plymouth. So just briefly, um, I recently finished my PhD at Newcastle University and I was working alongside uh, detergent manufacturer Procter & Gamble and we were interested in developing new enzyme technologies to combat clothing, um, clothing aging. And we're also looking at microfiber release during laundry and the subsequent fate of those fibers in terms of microbial colonization and biodegradation. It was really here where um, I gained an insight and a passion for trying to tackle some of the, some of the, some of the global uh, real world problems, which then gave me an interest into the, the world of plastics, where I got a research fellowship at the University of Plymouth, working with um, Richard Thompson, who's, who's you know, the godfather of, of microplastics, if you like. So working with some of the, the world's best scientists from around the world, so in quite a privileged position. Uh, where I come in, in in that team is is my focus over the last year or so um, has been um, conducting litter surveys in Indonesia to understand where litter is in Indonesia, uh, the types and, and solutions to, to some some of the problems. Okay, so <clears throat> for the for the purposes of this webinar, I want to focus on 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 three main aspect aspects of the of the plastic cycle, if you like, from the sources and, and where it goes once it gets into the environment, touch on the fate and, and some of the some of the potential impacts and um, and solutions that I've come across in my own research or solutions that we need to do as a society uh, going forward. And a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not going to solve all the plastics world's problems in this next 35, 40 minutes, but hopefully give you some idea of the discussions that I've had or the inadequacies in, in policy so far, some of the work that is being done and some of the work that needs to be done. So just to start at the very at the very beginning, if those who aren't too familiar with the with, with, with plastics, it was 1850s when the first sort of hint of plastics um, came to be when uh, Alexander Parks mixed nitric acid with cellulose to get this malleable product. But it wasn't until 1907 where Leo Bakerland um, first produced the real synthetic plastic Bakelite. And with each passing decade, the production around the world has increased. The different types of polymers have changed um, <clears throat> with mass production really kickstarting during the Second World War. Into the 50s, we were producing about 5 million, plastic, 5 million tons around the world of plastic till today where we're producing almost 400 million tons every year. The first observations and recordings of plastic in the ocean were in, were in the uh, early 70s. But it wasn't until the early 2000s where plastic research really kicked off, and particularly in 2004, for microplastic research with one of Richard's papers of uh, Lost at Sea, where are, all, where are all the plastics? And for those who are familiar with, with uh, the world of plastic science, we, these numbers should be um, familiar. For those that aren't, to give you an idea of the global production since 1907, we've produced over 9 billion tonnes, with a majority of uh, plastic entering the environment and even more into landfill or burnt. Only a fraction is being collected of those that have been collected. 5% um, is being converted to, to, to new plastic. The best estimates are still from the, <clears throat> well, leading on from the 2015 paper by, by, by Jan, Janbeck looking at 
approximately 15 million tons or up to 15 million tons of plastic enter the ocean each year. These estimations are est estimated to triple uh, by 2025. And if you look around the, the globe um, on the various groups that are studying plastic, uh, the, the numbers change very slightly, but it's between 70, 80% of marine litter tends to be, be plastic. And those in initial findings were from, from OSPAR. And I think it's important to flag this, this early on in, in, in the talk of plastic pollution is sort of gets this umbrella term where, where but when you think about it, it's not just it's not just one type of plastic. Plastic comes in many different uh, size categories from macro plastics, uh, which are typically anything bigger than 20 millimeters up to the mega plastics, to the micro plastics, where I've spent much of my research. Um, which were originally defined as less than one millimeter, these truly microscopic components of plastic, which, which are formed from the degradation uh, of larger plastics. But it was later changed by EU and NOAA legislation to, to, to five millimeters, which is the general consensus now, to incorporate a wider range that may have some harm in the environment. And finally, we got right down to the very small things, nanoplastics, which still remains a bit of a mystery, and there's certainly a gap in our, in our, in our knowledge to date where even some of the best analytical equipment can't detect nanoplastics. Um, so it's unsure of their, their impact so far. <clears throat> and just to focus on um, microplastics for a moment, as I say, it's been where most of my research up until now has been, um, has been focused towards. And again, I've put the bullet point at the bottom there that this source is of microplastic is, is a heterogeneous source of pollution. It's not one type, you've got different shapes, sizes, polymers, the chemical cocktail that goes within to the polymer, the, the chemicals that absorb onto the polymer when it's in the environment. And just to give you a few examples here, car tire particles, when we, when we drive our cars, release these small fragments. Uh, the group at Plymouth here are currently looking at quantifying uh, those particles in the environment using analytical instrumentation known as Pyrolysis GCMS. Uh, we've got things like marine coatings, you, the majority of, of, of paint on ship's hulls tends to be plastic and they get released uh, when the ship's hull corrodes, right down to the small plastic pellets, which have previously been put into things like cosmetic products, which, have, which, were, which were, were later later banned. And this figure on the right, I mean, it, it's, it's a nice figure that represents the different sources quite well, but it doesn't give you a picture of the uncertainty within the environment. But <clears throat> at the top there, you can see synthetic textiles um, are estimated in this um, in this paper by the IUCN um, that are one of the most abundant plastics. And that correlates well with the academic literature in the fact that when you go into the environment, you see that <clears throat> if you take a sediment core or look in the stomach of, um, of a fish or digestive tract of invertebrates, that, 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 that plastic fibres tend to be in, amongst the highest um, in, in highest abundance. Now, it's very difficult to say that's categorically linked back to synthetic textiles. Things like discarded shipping, uh, uh, fishing gear can be broken down into, into smaller fragments as well. But <clears throat> I, I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about the about synthetic fibers drawing laundry and some of the earlier research I did um, during my, my PhD. So it was first realized in, in 2011 uh, by by, by Brown, uh, a group looking who, who linked plastics on plastic fibers on shorelines to, to laundry um, washing. And <clears throat> since that 2011 period, there's been a really mixed message in the, in the scientific world, as well as the, the public domain on, on what are the drivers of microfiber release and subsequently what are the solutions, solutions to it. Um, and to give you an example, fabric softener, being one, some groups are saying there's an increase in microfiber release, some saying there's a decrease in fiber release, some say that had no effect at all. But when you looked at the, the, the methodologies within some of those papers, you see that it's often not always used correctly. Some groups would use it throughout the entire study when in actual fact use it at the end of a, uh, of a final um, main wash. Other examples about mechanical agitation, some groups were looking at small scale tests with steel balls, which probably wouldn't represent real interactions of textile to textile. Um, so it's quite a mixed message and some consumer groups saying, oh, we should be adopting these cycles, for example, delicate cycles, as it thought to protect our clothing from microfiber release. But we were in a quite a unique position. As I say, I was working with Potter and Gamble during my, um, my, my, my PhD. So we had this lab on the right there um, where we had 
over 100 different washing machines from all over the world uh, where we could test a variety of, um, of different things. And we took their sort of practical know-how mixed with our uh, analytical tools to, to try and set the story straight. And this problem of microfiber release is also exacerbated by the fact that we produce so many fibers each year for the textile industry. And in the advent of, of, of fast fashion, where you've got a high turnover of, of inexpensive, um, low quality goods, where we buy them, we wear them once or twice, we wash them once or twice, and we discard them. There are 235 million items of, of clothing are sent to UK landfill each year. And this is a global problem. Over a third of the, of the world wash their clothes on a weekly basis with over 800 million washing machines. So it's something that we wanted to tackle and to, to, to look at the drivers of microfiber release to get down to the cause. We, we set up this uh, small scale lab based study. So we use these things called a turgotometer uh, in the middle, which is what eight one liter pots, which sort of mimic um, full scale washing machines, if you like. So we took our, our laser cut fabrics, we put them in there, we tested things like water volume, uh, temperature, detergent, spin speed. Um, we took the fibers, we filtered it through a nano, uh, through, through a nylon sieve to, re to remove any of the dye or, or detergent products and then onto Watman um, 22 micron filter paper. And we use this piece of machinery called DigiI. So DigiI is used in the detergent in industry for really accurate measurements of color. So we harness that capability by um, putting our fibers into this controlled illumination box with a camera. And it basically looks at the color of those fibers and the, the more fibers there are, the darker the color, and we can get a very accurate number of the <clears throat> of the fibers and then the mass of the fibers using this calibration curve. So taking known quantities of fibers, putting them in the DGI, taking a photo, then looking at unknown number of fibers using the equation of the line of best fit, and voila, you've got your number. Now, in the small scale testing, what we realized, what we found was this high water volume seemed to consistently increase microfiber release. So the next thing we wanted to do was then look in real consumer cycles to see if it's a similar story and delicate cycles use a high volume of water and low spin speeds um, we are tested cotton standard washes you might do at home longer washes and, and really fast washes as well and we saw that delicate cycles actually released 800,000 more fibers than your, your typical standard wash and we hypothesized that this was down to the fact that if you take an individual microfiber it's got very high to surface um, um, area uh, high surface age volume ratio and consequently it exhibits a quite a low Reynolds number. So you've got these large viscous forces in, in the delicate cycles that act into to pluck and remove microfibers. And um, when we published this, we, we had a message of, of, of three really easy solutions that we can, we can do to reduce our microfiber release. And that was avoid those delicate cycles for everyday washing, which was going against some of the consumer best practices ensure full wash loads are used because it's the similar argument you are reducing that excess of volume of water volume by using more textiles and particularly in countries like north america where they have these large traditional washing machines with 60 70 liters of water this transition to higher energy efficiency which to say electricity but also help reduce microfiber release and i've got this and the, the, the image on the top right there just demonstrates on the left the 800,000 microfibers versus the cotton wash on the right. Um, and this, this image in the bottom right of the screen is, is now rotating. Some of you might be thinking, okay, why bother with, with just plastic textiles, synthetic textiles? Can we not move to just cotton-based textiles? And some of the work we did here was imaging cotton textiles, looking at the, the differences in crystallinity. So the things in green are the really strong components of cellulose, which give it structural components. The, the things in red are, are, are the amorphous regions, which give it, it its flexibility. And the bits in blue is the rest of the fiber. And it's these sort of, these strong um, crystalline components as when we go from native cellulose one and we, we treat it in the textile industry to create cotton textiles, it, it changes its, its chemical structure from cellulose one to cellulose two. And this cellulose two is non-native to the environment. So you see when you go into the environment, you look at a sediment core or a fish guts, you see there's a large number of cotton fibers in there as well that seem to be persisting in the environment, perhaps then we, uh, we, we would assume. Okay, so we've got 
a lot of plastic being made. Um, we've got different sources, particularly microplastics. Where is it going? And this image on, on the left is um, taken from um, one of our field sites uh, or just north of our field site in, in Indonesia along um, the, the, the coast. And it's estimated that the majority of, of marine derived plastic is, is traced back to land based sources in, 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 and rivers tend to be um, a pathway of those uh, of that source of plastic from the environment, environment on land into the ocean. Now, <clears throat> once it goes from the river into the into the sea, this graphic on the right, um, which is from uh, a previous colleague, a PhD student at Newcastle University, uh, Alethea, who did some work modeling the positively uh, buoyant um, accumulation patterns of plastic in the in the environment. So this is more about looking at where the plastic's going rather than the, the, the concentrations within. And you can see the plastics tend to aggregate within ocean currents in these large ocean giant systems. And you might be familiar with the, with the great uh, Pacific Ocean Garbage Patch. But another <clears throat> stat from that paper was actually saying that of all the plastics that have ever been made and entered the ocean accounts for 1% on the sea surface. We have 5 trillion pieces of plastic sitting on the ocean surface, um, but that's only 1% of the plastics in the sea. So where, where is all, all the plastic? Now, some of it is neutrally buoyant, some of it is negatively buoyant, and it might be suspended in the water column. It might be ingested by a lot of marine organisms or deposited on shorelines around the world. But interestingly, there's increasing evidence that the deep sea might be a final sink for, 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 for plastic entering the ocean. And if we look at some of the deep submersibles that can now take us down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, it's the deepest part in the sea, we see that plastic has beaten us there, whether that's bags, bottles, fibers, um, <clears throat> at the bottom of the ocean. So the next thing you might ask yourself is, okay, so how long is plastic sticking around for? And that's important when you want to start thinking about the impact as well. How long is the longevity of plastic in order to maybe cause some sort of harm? And this paper here, this, this figure from, from Chama et al, um, tries, to, uh, tries to calculate the, the plastic longevity. It's based on the plastic's half-life, so the time taken for 50% of the mass to decrease. And and they looked at accelerated um, conditions, so pre-treated with UV light for degradation and non-accelerated maybe environmental studies. Um, and the two, two key take-home messages here, I think, are that there's still a lot of uncertainty. The, 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 the numbers seem to change depending on the papers you're looking at, whether it's 58 years or 120 years for a plastic bottle to degrade, estimated, up to a couple of thousands for high-density polyethylene. Pipes. The second thing is that plastics degrade under a different rate depending on the environment you're in. So if you're a plastic bottle floating on the sea, you've got a large amount of UV light, which is the most prominent degradation pathway on the surface of, on the, surface of the ocean through chain scission. Likewise, therm, uh, thermal degradation, if you're a plastic bottle in, in, in the desert or, on, or on, the, on the beach. Whereas if you go into the deep sea, you, you, you're losing that light. You know, what are the other more prominent um, degradation pathways in these different environments. And that's what got us interested in moving into some of our, our, our work on microbial biodegradation. And I'll put this on here to, um, this is this this figure on the right here was um, from a group in Japan uh, by Yoshida uh, that went to a pl plastic recycling center and took, a, took some plastic bottles, took them back into the lab, isolated and cultured the microbial community on there and lo and behold, they found this, this bacterium, IDNL sacchiensis, that had the genes encoded two enzymes to break down the PET polymer and then further its intermediates into its, into its monomers of terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol um, for, for growth. And it's interesting to us, um, during my PhD, that, that if you look at the numbers there, 2016, that paper was, that said my plastic production really kicked off in the 50s, 60s. So from a microbial evolutionary standpoint, it's not been around that long plastic, but yet there's, there's things in the environment that are already adapted and producing enzymes to degrade them. I would say at the bottom there, that's the fastest known degrader of, of, of plastic today, this, this leaf cutinase, this leaf compost cutinase, which is a group of, of, of thermophilic actinomyces, which have 90% low crystallinity 
pet degradation after after 72 hours. So it's probably not an industrially viable thing in the minute, but perhaps one day we might have plastic biocomposting in our home. So we wanted to understand if that if that plastic community is is only in Japan or is it around the world? How does it change in different environments? So we were interested in characterizing this community known um, as, as the plastosphere. So the plastosphere is a community or, or the microbial community that is found in higher numbers on plastic versus the surrounding water column. So what we did, we were looking at the deep sea plastosphere by attaching on the left of the screen that this, this deep sea lander, um, polyurethane samples, polystyrene samples, and, and limestone as a, as a hard substrate control. And what we did, we put it into the Northeast Atlantic at 1800 meters for 420 days. Uh, we took it out, we did the, the DNA extractions and um, um, we, we sequenced the V4 region on the 16S gene, which is used for bi bi microbial identification. Uh, and what we saw in the top right of the screen, that um, the cartoon graphic, uh, we had 3,700 unique um, ASVs, which basically means we had 3,700 different um, uh, taxons, different, almost species level, different um, um, types of, or, or, or not types, but different uh, species of bacteria. And that was distributed as a, within a core community. Um, we had unique communities, majority on polystyrene and the, uh, the other substrates as well. The figure in the bottom right shows the top taxa at family level, the top 14 taxa. And I've mainly put that on screen to, to highlight that the, the distribution is different. It's not uniform across the repeats. And that's really important when we're trying to define the plastosphere, I believe anyway, where some studies only use one plastic. They take out the sea and look at the community and say, this is unique to plastic when, when actually the, the numbers do change and the families within can also vary. And we also saw 33% of all the taxa we of all the reads we saw couldn't be sequenced at genius, couldn't be identified at, at genius levels. There's a lot of unknowns in the deep sea as well. And the main, one of the main takeaways from this paper that we published um, this year was re trying to rethink what it, what it means to be a plastosphere community. And why that's important, I suppose, is if we're trying to understand the role of plastic in the ocean and, and its impact compared to non-plastic substrates, um, we want to know the communities that are are, are, are utilizing plastic. Um, and perhaps the, the communities that are able to utilize the plastic can be used for more, can be used as a source of potentially novel enzymatic um, solutions to, to, the, to the plastic plastic problem. So basically what we did is by, by, by comparing, rather at the start, I said the plastic sphere is compared against the plastic to the water. We were looking at the plastic compared to non-plastic because the, the microbial ecology is obviously fairly different when you're comparing things that like to stick to things against um, planktonic, so sessile versus planktonic bacteria, if you like. So we saw that the majority of, or a low proportion of our community accounted for the for 92% for, for um, of the types of bacteria that were on there. So these generalist colonizers accounted for 92%, which are probably sticking to anything and not necessarily there just because it's plastic. Then we had transient microorganisms were things that we found on a few of the repeats, but not all, more random. And then this plastic enriched taxa was about 28 genera uh, we showed. And within the genera, we saw that some of them were also found in places like hydrothermal vents in, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So potentially using you know, plastic as some sort of uh, stepping stone for, 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 for oceanic dispersal. And that is potentially problematic if you consider some of the enriched species like Ali Vibrio, which is a nasty pathogen for the fish farming industry. And since then, we've also been looking at some of the hydrocarbon and clastic bacteria, so the things that break down uh, hydrocarbons and potentially more reluctant things like, like plastic. And on the example on the right is one of the microbes we've, we've isolated and, and sticks to plastic very well. It's a halomonas strain. Okay, and then just to take a step back from um, from the deep sea and, and the microbial community and, and really trying to think of, of the, the overall arching um, issues around, 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 around plastic and the potential impact, which is, a, which is a, I guess, a funny word to use because it's hard to you know, put a statistical test to it. But I think it's, it's, it's in three 
main areas and all interlinked from the financial aspects of of the plastic problem to, to human health and environment and the animals that that, that live within it so to give you some examples um on the economic side uh, the un estimate uh it's 13 billion us dollars in plastic damage and that's in terms of tourism a shipping industry um <clears throat> and in the uk to give another example is we spend 18 million uh, euros uh, a year on on beach clean which is a 37 percent increase over the last 10 uh, last 10 years the us west coast spend half a billion pounds of beach cleanups to keep it the beaches uh, uh clean then if we move on to sort of human health and Im impacts well this is not an image i've taken but i've seen this in indonesia when we've been doing our our, our surveys where in in a lot of communities where there is an, was a lack of waste management or no waste management at all uh, people will will actually burn the waste outside the front of their houses um which released which which surprisingly there's, there's a frighteningly little known about the, the 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 chemical impact of of what those gases may do to us but i would assume it's not very good the other things around well-being are are you know the psycho psychological research of when you go down to the beach the feel good factor you get of, of having a walk along along the sea and the impact that you know, the visual impact that um plastic has um to, to tourists on the beaches then if we look at the the environment uh, and and wildlife and for, for larger those macro plastics i said start like bags fishing nets these larger plastics are well documented to 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 lead to entanglement and ingestion of of marine of the marine megafauna or seabirds uh, i think the latest number is just over nine, 914 species have been entangled or ingested marine plastics and led to fatalities then you get down to the smaller microplastics a lot of the research in the minute is looking at micro my, uh, microplastic toxic toxicity so um some of the things that when plastic gets into into the ocean because uh, it's got a it's small high surface area to volume ratio chemicals like to absorb to the surface whether that be persistent organic pollutants uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons um, or the things that make plastic we put into plastics like UV stabilizers, flame retardants um, that leach during degradation, like phthalates, uh, bisphenol A, uh, that have shown to have problems, particularly in, in some marine vertebrates. Um, now, it also gets some criticism, I should, I should mention here, some of the research that is being done on the issues around or the impact around or harm of, of microplastic. Well, there's a great paper a few years ago, Busey, um, that said only 17% of, of, of lab-based studies use real-world concentrations of microplastics. But there's a, another paper that came out by saying, actually, in the next 50 to 100 years, I think Everett paper would say that we might reach some of those levels. So um, there, is, there, there is cause for harm, potentially. Okay, then just moving on to um some some of the solutions and my boss uh, or pi here richard likes to use 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 this line which i've adopted here which is um plastic is not the problem but it's a, it's the symptom of, of the problem it's a symptom of an outdated linear business model by uh, the fact that back in the you know 50, 60s 70s and these are two magazine cuttings from the 60s and 70s where they're highlighting the great throwaway nature of plastics you know you can buy it use it once, throw it away, go to the shop the next day and do the same and same over. And I think, again, that was okay when we were producing, you know, five, six, seven million tons of plastic because the waste management streams could, could cope with that. But now, you know, we've got a growing population, there's almost 400 million tons of plastic being made each year around the world. We can't cope with the amount we are producing, so we need to change. And some of the solutions that might lead to the change are not new these are things that have been around for, for a long time reduce reuse and recycle but our adoption of them has been quite slow for example like reduce plastic straws or um single use plastic um uh, packaging that is supermarkets are now so some of them are starting to move away from the ban in plastic straws it's great and it's on the back of a lot of public um media press as well so but is that going to solve the the overall plastic problem probably not 
reuse things like the plastic bag scheme in the 10 20p whatever it is now tax seems to have helped reduce numbers of plastic bags being being produced and those sort of methods are ways of, of turning off off the tap if you like but there's probably always going to be times where we're going to need plastic you know plastic is still a great product in the uk you know we can all use refillable uh, water bottles because we have a clean source of water in places like indonesia where there's a lack of clean drinking water we still need plastic bottles manufacturers like coca-cola could have produced coke lemonade wherever it might be you're probably always going to use a plastic bottle so it's thinking about the product's end of life as well and how we how we facilitate the recycling i said at the start only a fraction is recycled at the minute so how do we improve the products we 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 manufacture to make that linear business model turn into a circular one that feeds back into the plastic cycle and to try and give you some um examples of this well um of of design changes so again it's thinking here now at the minute things are made to look good and do a specific function where they're not really thought the end of life you know what happens when we've used them and we put them in the bin or we've someone's thrown it into the environment what happens then and to give you some examples of potentially changes in the designs that maybe help reduce some of the plastic getting into the into the oceans one is i've already touched on laundry and there's research that shows you know different types of textiles reduce different amounts of microfibers whether they're knitted fabrics or woven fabrics and perhaps that's a better idea than putting these now my, my um, microfiber filters or wastewater treatment plants where where even the best wastewater treatment plants in the uk that catch 99 percent of, of particles still release 65 up to 65 million uh microplastic particles into the environment every day so if we can change it you know at the design stage rather than try and clean up after ourselves maybe it's a it's a better approach other um solutions um there's a well now postdoc um um who did work at plymouth looking at cosmetic cosmetic beads and counted you know millions of plastic beads in these cosmetic products which led to uk legislation ban but the point there being is that was a they've been these cosmetic products have, have been around for 50 60 years if you look back into it's in the patent history so why has no one thought about where these plastics are going for the last 60 years why does it take some student in the lab to to, to lead to policy change other things like uh, pet bottles in the top left corner you know great products very recyclable but as soon as you start adding some some color money as as manufacturers add to, to stand out from the rest of the crowd that halves the value to recyclers taking their their, their waste to a recycling station and um, devalues the 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 quality of the of the product if you like uh, a final example in the bottom right now that is a bio biodegradable bag from a well-known supermarket and that was put into the ocean again by a student at Plymouth um, for three years into the sea, took it out after three years and it could still hold a full bag of shopping. So I think there's mislabeling and misrepresentation from, from manufacturers to the consumer saying, oh, this is our biodegradable product. Yes, it might be biodegradable in certain conditions in the industry setting if the temperature and, uh, and pressure and things like that are right. But when you get into the environment where those conditions are very different, you're probably not going to get the biodegradable nature of the of those bags and this is also um you know context specific i should highlight i mean here in the uk you know we are privileged to have a, a recycling uh, or rubbish truck come to our come to our homes every week but places like indonesia where i spent um the, our, our, our latest field work um has 270 million people living there, majority being coastal communities in areas where there is some sort of waste management in the picture here on the right, it tends to be overwhelmed. And in places, particularly island communities, though Indonesia is the largest uh, island archipelago in the world, 17,000 islands, I think, um, where there's no waste management at all. And 5 million is estimated that 5 million waste pickets throughout Indonesia, that's about 2% of the population. So 2% of the population can make some sort of living by going around picking up waste. And if, where do they take that waste? Well, there's, there's tends to be one national recycling center in Surabaya. So can we provide potential evidence of, of where we may need other recycling centers to facilitate that plastic circular economy? 
And just to finish on some of the work that we I've now mentioned in Indonesia, trying to put some of these things together. Well, the Indonesian government set this quite ambitious target to reduce 70% of plastic entering the marine environment by, by 2025. And we've sort of become part of that mandate, trying to, um, our projects sort of divided into, into six areas, if you like, from uh, modeling and, and estimating where we think plastic is going into the environment and how it moves around from societies to the ocean. Where I come in and my team at Plymouth is looking at quanta or validating some of those estimates by empirical data with boots on the ground, if you like. Um, but also try to quantify the different types of plastic and the functions of the plastic, whether that's in food or beverage or home products that may lend themselves to more targeted interventions. Um, <clears throat> the third part of the, the, the project really is looking at the environmental impact or ecosystem services. And it's a, a really interesting idea of, of trying to put a monetary value on, on our environment and what is the cost of inaction, which I think is a great way to try and incentivize groups, governments to, 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 to see that if we don't do something, it's actually got a, a financial value as well as an environmental uh, um, cost. We have psychologists in the team looking at the behaviors and perceptions. So why do people um, throw waste away? How do they do it? Uh, are they likely to, um, to integrate into a solution that someone puts in? One of the groups in Indonesia, a group called Systemic, have, have put in waste management infrastructure, uh, but they see that the people there, a large proportion of the people there in places like um, Northwest Bali, um, don't see it as, a, as something they should pay for, but rather the government should be paying for. So how do you get people to engage with the things that you're trying to put forward as solutions? And we have four UK universities and four Indonesian universities, as well as, well as other Indonesian action delivery partners trying to help us in this. And all of these things are trying to feed into this design intervention. So new design, design out, if you like, uh, some of the some of the, the shortcomings are, are, are of previous products. And we're testing these in the living lab in Bali um, and, and, and really trying to create that, <clears throat> go back to this, this circular economy. And I'll give you a, the final example of one of the things that we've seen is these plastic sachets on the left. This is a warung or a local shop in Indonesia where the majority of products tend to be sent to tend to be um, sold in these multi-layer plastic sachets were very hard to to recycle even Unilever had this big recycling plan over the last they announced five years ago and they've now announced that we're not really carrying on with it because we realize it's not an economically viable thing and again that's an example of we're, we're being reactive rather than proactive you know there's there's we're, we're reacting to a situation where we've already got a load of these things in, in the environment. The picture in the top right is, again, what I've taken in Indonesia and an example of some of these sachets, which the team at Pisces are now trying to look at as if different design interventions to this problem. So a few final thoughts. Um, I still think you know, plastics is, is a fantastic product, but it's not been uh, the business, that linear business model needs to improve. Uh, how do we do that? Perhaps there's a more focus on the end of life in products rather than just being fit for a single purpose. There's not one solution. As I said there's many different types of plastic. Maybe we need to have plastics that are targeted towards recycling that we all probably always going to need, things that we can help cut down and reuse. Uh, and finally, the, the interventions need to be across the whole plastics value chain rather than just looking at one independent part of it. So thank you very much for listening. If anyone wants to get in touch, um, my email's down in, in the bottom left there. Um, uh, and thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Max, for that presentation. Um, really interesting to hear about the kind of plastic life cycle. Uh, and I think a really powerful message there about being um, proactive rather than reactive, something that comes up a lot in the environmental sector is this idea of, um, of, build, of building good design and thinking about that design stage. So thank you for that. Um, we'll now move into the question and answer section. So anyone, um, if you've got any questions for Max, please do put these in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if we can get to them all, um, I'll read them out on your, on your behalf. Um, so, so just to kick things off, um, you mentioned um, uh, the microorganism that, that is breaking, can break down plastic using an enzyme. What are some of the challenges of actually producing this enzyme on an industrial scale? And, and are the, the waste products or the breakdown products, are they also damaging or are they not damaging? 
Um, well, yeah, good question. So the the the, the waste products, the, the relatively benign monomers in the environment, terephthalic acid, ethylene glycol. If you if you take PET as the example, in PET polyethylene terephthalate uh, tends to be the model substrate used by groups trying to look at plastic degradation because it's basically got heteroatoms in the in the in the polymer which which are susceptible to to degradation. Uh, in terms of producing the the enzymes themselves, you know, there's a whole um, there's a lot of research now trying to take the the and the enzyme from the bacteria and protein engineer it to make it work better. So that that enzyme, the Adenella one, was protein engineered by a group in uh, Portsmouth, I think, who who made it work for um, higher crystallinity. So you have this low crystallinity types of plastic, which are hard, easier to break down than than higher, and they they managed to break down some of the the more difficult things to break down if you like but it's still it's still a it's still you know the degradation times are still quite slow if you like you know still the the processes that are used um in industry are not being challenged that much at the minute yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you um and do you know anything about the state of plastics in the atmosphere um presumably they're present in both micro and nano scale yeah again uh, good question so i mean some of the the latest you know, finding microplastics is in the top of Everest, which um, which is probably got there through 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 atmospheric dispersal. Um, there's all other research like when we wear our, our garments, there's lots of being released, equal well, potentially an equal number of being released when we're wearing them to when we're washing them, which are which are in the atmosphere somewhere. I don't know too much how it's dispersed, but just by looking at where it is, I would assume so. Yes. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and slightly related to this, um, regarding tyre wear particles, do you see any alternative products that can be used to recycle rubber? Or is the best solution to reduce miles driven or vehicle weight? It's hard to see a solution that society will accept that can reduce this pollution. Yeah, good, good question. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm, I'm not, um, no, no, not, not a plastic engineer to, to maybe best suited to answer the question of alternatives to, um, to, to rubber specifically. but it's quite a new, it's not a new concept, but there's a lot, there's a lot of data gaps within the potential problem. So maybe it's, it's the things that are in rubber that are also um, the problem. So maybe if you can remove some of those chemical components of the, of the rubber, um, I, I don't know, but we, yeah, we'll see the group of Plymouth here are hopefully working towards that. So. Great. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned at the end of your presentation, um, biodegradable plastics and, and, um, how they they might not be labelled um, in the best way. But do you think in general they represent a good um, alternative to the more traditional plastic? <clears throat> yeah, again, so it's a funny one with, with biodegradables, again, because um, so, uh, so, so some, there's some ideas of trying to put, um, you know, things like enzymes or solutions within the, the product it, itself to make it, you know, break down. But it's like sort of like the chicken in the egg, which if you want a product to, to, to last its service in use, so you want it to be made of the best stuff to do that, the product and not just be crumbling away. And it's this end of life, which we, which we need to think more about it, but it's still relatively new, the biodegradables. And again, at, at the minute, I think a lot of it is misrepresented represented with what is biodegradable. You know, I've said in an industry setting, biodegradable is very different to what we may look as compostable in the environment. So breaking it down right down to its sugars um, is what I would see as, as a better biodegradable route rather than what, what we have today. And that image there with the plastic biodegradable bag is probably the best piece of evidence you need to look at. Mm. Oh, really interesting, thank you. Um, a more technical question next. Um, the structure of PET, <coughs> is quite, PET sorry, is quite amenable to break down by modified enzymatic pathways. However, polyolefins, which are with essentially mainly carbon-carbon links, are far harder to break. What other evolved enzymes have been identified breaking down other types of plastic polymer? Yeah, so <clears throat> before the IDNLA, the actual petase um, gene was, was discovered, um, cutinases, um, I showed at the bottom of, of one of the slides, one of the, the best known is a, is a cutinase from a group of thermophilic actinomyces, um, esterases, I've shown to be quite quite good at breaking down um, um, polymers because they've got ester. So you have a, an enzyme that breaks an ester bond in in, in polyethylene terephthalate where you've got those 
you know, ester groups. Um, lipases have also been shown to be pretty good at breaking down um, different polymers. Um, and you tend to see actually thermophilic microorganisms, and a lot of them tend to be fungi as well as bacteria, have some of the best plastic degraders. They work at this higher temperature around the glass transition temperature of, of PET, where you come from a, a really hard glass-like substance, this more viscous substance, if you like, and it's more prone to degradation. So there are different enzymes out there other than the, the, the now PETase gene. Oh, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll try and sneak in two more questions, um, if you don't mind, um, before we before we log off. Um, one attendee here saying, brilliant talk, Max. Um, they've just returned from Vancouver and a bear entered their garden and did droppings on the lawn. It was, um, it was frightening how much uh, plastic was actually present in these droppings. With that in mind, do you know if there are any studies being undertaken as to the quantities of plastic that animals are ingesting in the, around the world? Uh, oh, thanks, Peter. I was, I was in Vancouver last last Christmas. What what, what a great place! Um, <clears throat> so, other plastics in the what was the final part of that question? Sorry, other plastics in stomach contents. Exactly, that plastics being ingested by animals. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, yeah from from the larger stuff. You might be more familiar with like the marine megafauna, which get publicised quite a lot from like plastic bottle lids in in the stomachs of whales or or, or birds, right down to the small stuff. Um, the microplastics that are ingested by fish in, in smaller invertebrates. Um, and obviously the impact is going to be quite different on what you're ingesting, the size of it and the size of you as well. You know, it's going to be different if a, a small you know, plankton um, or a small invertebrate ingests, um, you know, a fragment compared to, you know, a baleen whale or something. So, yeah, there are numerous examples in the literature of, as I said, 914 species in ingestion and entanglement for, for larger plastics. And I don't know the exact number on microplastics, but I would assume it's quite high. Thank you. Um, and are there any good fabrics for clothing in terms of breakdown into the wastewater system? If even cotton fibers, which are plastic free are a problem, is there anything good? <laughs> yeah, again, good question. I think it's, um, I think it's, um, I think a lot of it works now is on, on the textile construction as well as the fiber type, as I said, like knitted, are quite a loose structure and tend to, to and tend to release a lot of fibers, whereas I think more like you know woven or, or denim maybe more of a compact pack structure. So the textile construction um, is one thing. Um, uh, the, the, the fabric type it, itself, there's there's some work also being done here looking at the different stages of of that transition of cotton to 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 what we use in the textile industry and working out where the problem. Of microfiber release lies there so there, the, hopefully those answers um should be coming but there are there is evidence that different um textiles release different amounts of microfibers i'm not sure if there's the holy grail yet but um but hopefully in the next couple of years we we may have you know um certain textiles which 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 we're more likely should be using Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, do you have time for one more just before we um, head yeah, off? Yeah, yeah. All, all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with projects such as the Ocean Cleanup, it's great to remove plastic from the environment. But if we can't handle the volume and some are not recyclable due to weathering or the chemicals that make them up, what are we going to do with all of the plastic? <clears throat> yeah, great. And again, good question. Um, you know, some groups in around the world, there's quite a few different ocean cleanups. There's there's ocean cleanup, there's the Sungai Watch in, in Indonesia, which actually starts to turn a lot of their um, you know, products into a lot of the plastics in, 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 into different different products. Uh, some other groups just put it back in back into landfill, perhaps, which is you know <clears throat> still an environmental issue with all the leachates that go into the soil. Um, so this is why it's it's well, the, some of the solutions I tried to say at the end about turning the tap off where we can reduce and reuse, but then where we do need plastic, it's it's now about the design stage of making sure that when we do put things into into the environment, um, they can be, or before they go into the environment, they can be recycled better. So the plastic that's already being collected now, some of it's being sent to landfill, some of it is being recycled, the bits that can be, um, but there's not, an answer for the things that can't be recycled, they, they are being put into landfill or burnt. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Max. Uh, really interesting talk. And I think that's um, 
you can see that the attendees are really loving it as well with all of the questions coming through. I'm sorry if I didn't make it to your questions today. Um, we are now out of time, um, but I will pass these on to Max um, so that he knows what questions are being asked. Um, so thank you so much, Max, for the presentation and thanks to everyone attending today. I hope you found that as interesting as I did.